on this, but um, I'd, I'd want to start almost where you, you ended with the, the importance of learning to share natural resources, because if we can't do that, then we're in a very, very difficult situation um, in this world. And you know, as was said earlier, we're at the in the UN sort of water decade. Um, water we we know is absolutely essential for life on this planet, um, and yet we still can't find a way to actually ensure that everybody has access to safe drinking water. We've been hearing about what a growing problem um, it is in this part of the world, and indeed in many others, and the the, the threat in terms of conflict. But like so many of these conflicts related to natural resources, you often end up destroying what it is that you've been fighting over. And so, you know, I think in terms of water, that becomes even more important than many other resources. But we've been hearing about the, the growing problems. We know that it's a political problem. We saw this in the, the major floods in, in Pakistan a couple of years back, where the issues about how the flood water was controlled, what was done to try and um, mitigate the dangers there, ran into internal politics as much as anything else. So a lot of this is about political choices. That the pollution issue is certainly a major one. Um, whether it's a result of industrialization and the pollutants into um, river waters, groundwater, whether it's um, agricultural sort of runoff, whether it's human and animal waste in those rivers, that if we're not actually taking care of that resource, you end up with a dead river anyway running through your land, which is going to create more problems than it solves. The demand is certainly growing um, <coughs> for a whole set of reasons. I mean, you, you know, Pakistan is a major cotton producer. Cotton is heavily, heavily dependent on water. Estimates of over 700 billion gallons being withdrawn from the Indus annually for cotton production. Um, you, you know, which you've got enormous amounts of water for the, the industrial production, for the um, agricultural production. It's an issue between that divides rural from urban as well in, in many ways. Um, those at the end of the river systems have been described in some parts of the world as economically orphaned because of what's happened to the river as it's made its way down from its sources. So, and climate change is certainly a major issue within this now, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. The European Parliament resolution that was done a number of years back now on questions around Kashmir did make reference to the Indus Waters Treaty. Um, you know, it was urging the governments of Pakistan and India to resolve the crucial sort of river issues affecting the headwaters, affecting the use of the rivers flowing through Jammu and Kashmir <coughs> as swiftly as possible. And it was also talking about the importance of water security and sustainable and secure energy supplies for the stability and growth of the region and notes in this regard the importance of developing irrigation and hydroelectric projects, and considers it imperative, we said in the parliament, that the governments of Pakistan and India continue their constructive dialogue. We might argue about how constructive, but at least there's still a dialogue on that, whereas you know, a number of areas, dialogue is increasingly still difficult. Um, and to consult representatives of the Kashmiris over the river issues and to urge them to adopt a holistic approach to water resources, recognizing the key links between water, land, local users, environment, and infrastructure. So we were certainly recognizing there the importance of the agreement and the need to look at it um, in a different way. That in terms of climate change, it's one of the things that as a, a delegation, you know, we've, we've paid a lot of attention to that indeed. The European Parliament now requires its delegations when we travel to raise questions about climate change and what is happening. We've, when we've been in the, um, the region as a whole, we visited um, ISIMOD, the research station centre that run, deals with the um, 
Hindu Kush Himalaya whole sort of water system. And it's one of the few bodies that can actually get governments that are in conflict in so many ways or certainly with strained relations to actually talk to each other about what is happening there. And there's no doubt that we are seeing, as we said, glacier melt. We've been up, we've looked at it ourselves. We've looked at those glacial lakes. We've heard about the potential consequences um, of what happens if those walls break. And of course, we're looking at an area here of seismic activity. And that the estimates that about what's happening in terms of glaciers in the Kashmir area, we're looking at approximately something like 10 million people's livelihoods being potentially affected <coughs> by glacier melt, by what happens um, to changing patterns of rain, snowfall, um, what that does for lower to lower food production, and a whole set of other consequences from that. So when we're looking at issues around how we manage water, it's also a question about how we manage climate because those two things are absolutely linked. I've heard Professor Stern talk about climate change as actually being a problem about water. Too much of it, too little of it, too much of it when you don't want it, and being sort of unpredictable too much at the wrong time. So one of the other areas I think that needs to come into consideration in this is what's happening in terms of the climate change negotiations. What um, role India and China play within those What's happening in terms of industrial pollution, the black carbon, which is helping to increase the rate of glacier melt. And that has to be something that the countries of South Asia through SARC really, really come to grips with. Because the effect on people, um, rural areas who possibly have no understanding of what is happening there, they just see things changing. It's absolutely essential for the livelihoods of so many people that this is also part of the, the discussions uh, about management. Mm -hmm. Also refer to some of the other problems here where it's also a question about who is seen as owning water resources and who provides access. And the right of individuals to access, as I say, clean drinking water, I think has to be the starting point and the maintenance of those supplies. We know that water is big business. There are estimates that in Karachi, something like $500 million a year are made out of, let's put it this way, an informal economy in water with those diverting public water supplies, selling them on um, elsewhere. That's very big money by anybody's standards. So questions about access, um, ownership and management become very important. It's not just a question about which government is responsible. It's also a question about how they then provide further management within that. Phil mentioned in his introduction questions as well about management in terms of the irrigation techniques and doing, making the best possible use of the water that you have. I think we're looking at probably adding to the existing agreement. I always get very nervous about people who say, you know, we're going to replace this agreement. Don't take anything off the table till you've got something else on there and, and agreed. Um, but I think issues about water quality, um, how to, you know, deal with pollution issues also has to be part of that now. It's a precious resource. You want it to be as usable, as high quality um, as possible so that you're not actually spreading poison on your land or into your products. You're actually keeping the quality of the water. And I think that's something where you know, the European Union learned some very tough lessons. Um, but water quality is a big issue for us. And that if you're really looking at quality, then it's also a question about sound science and having a scientific basis that you can trust in terms of water quality, measurement of how much water is being taken by whom, having some sort of trusted mechanism there, which probably means a third party um, in this. And uh, fundamental, I think, to a lot of this, and too, is questions about good governance. That it's, which is also, I think, a challenge um, in many parts of the world, but here as well. That, as I say, it's a precious resource, 
an essential one. It's linked to economic development, um, biodiversity, a whole set of things. The governance that goes alongside water has to be the highest quality that you can possibly manage. And I think that for those of us that are interested in trying to improve questions of governance, whether it's in um, parts of Pakistan, whether it's in parts of India, this is also something that we really need to concentrate on. You can have the best agreement in the world. Yes. If you can't actually manage it properly, then it was a very good start. But a lot of people suffer very bad consequences <coughs> through the poor management of such a precious resource. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, uh, for those very uh, innovative uh, um, thoughts. Uh, now we move on to Mr. Schultz. And uh, of course, uh, it will be a pleasure to hear uh, from him, Mr. Henry Schultz. Yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first of all congratulate you for organizing such an event, and in particular our hosts in the occasion of the World Water Day 2030, which we will celebrate on Friday this week. And I thank you in particular, uh, Mr. Trambu, and my colleague, um, Denjin, for, for welcoming the members of the <coughs> parliament in this, in this room and contributing to a topic which may be looking only from the aspect of the Kashmir conflict is not the central one or the purpose of the European Parliament, I can say, unfortunately, but it is the fact. So let's share with, uh, with me some thoughts about one of the most important topics, I guess, for the years to come. Uh, in my office, I have a poster of the water systems and the river systems worldwide. So I will remember any day 